When I write these film analyses, I usually start by watching the film with a notepad and writing down all the things I think are interesting. When I started watching Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love, the first thing I wrote was, five minutes in and every shot is a frame within a frame, meaning that every single shot feature characters not only framed by the rectangle of the film itself, but by smaller internal shapes as well. And this is a visual technique that filmmakers have used for decades. My favorite example is the great last shot in John Ford's masterpiece, The Searchers. But seldom is it used so ubiquitously. As the film went on, I had to cross out five from my little note and change it to six, seven, nine. It wasn't until minute 12 that I saw the first shot without some foreground obstruction. This shot, which crucially doesn't feature either of the two main characters. But wait. I'm getting ahead of myself. In the Mood for Love is the story of two married couples who happen to rent rooms in the adjacent homes of older couples in 1960s Hong Kong. The film focuses on the husband of one couple, Mr. Chow, and the wife of the other, Mrs. Chan, as they both gradually discover that their spouses are cheating on them with each other, and then how those two innocent victims of infidelity come together to deal with the pain of that. The film manages to be unsentimental with its subject matter while couching the events in sumptuous, painterly cinematography. The narrative skips and jumps forward through time at an erratic speed, as one might recall the story in memory, and the viewer is often left initially confused as to how much time has passed between scenes. This prompts a strong engagement with the film, a need to pay attention. But it also reflects how the film was made. There was little more than an outline when Wong Kar Wai and his crew began filming, a process that took a long 15 months, in which the script and the individual scenes were written on the fly by the director and the actors together. Which is surprising, because watching the film, you can't help but feel that you're in the hands of somebody in complete control. Visually and emotionally, In the Mood for Love is fully consistent. The film is so self-contained that it only features a handful of locations, each filmed from the same angle, so that you experience a kind of circular effect of returning again and again to the same things. This technique, far from feeling sluggish or repetitive, instead isolates against fixed backgrounds the things that actually are changing in the film, the inner lives of the two leads. And for the most part, these inner lives are explored wordlessly. The real action of this movie is in postures, glances, and touches. And by restricting the language, Wong Kar Wai echoes the restriction of action that plagues Mr. Chow and Mrs. Chan in 1960s Hong Kong, where they are under constant threat of gossip, a kind of surveillance from their landlords and the community at large. <laughs> This is one reason why everything is doubly framed. By placing objects in the foreground, the director enhances the feeling that the characters have of being observed, not to mention our own feelings of being observers. Observed and observing, seen and being seen, what we desire from others, what others desire from us, these are major themes of In the Mood for Love. I think the most extraordinary element of this film is what's introduced just after the two main characters admit to each other that their spouses are cheating. Instead of confronting the situation head on, their primary goal becomes to understand exactly how it happened. So we get this incredible scene where they reenact the seduction of their spouses, in which each attempt to embody the spouse of the other while being coached by the other on what they think the spouse really would or wouldn't do. This makes for a really complex but also kind of perverse interplay. Though the film aggressively focuses on only Mr. Chow and Mrs. Chant, to the point of never even showing the faces of their spouses, we're always aware that four people, not two, are involved here. But it's not four real people, it's two people and two phantoms. Think of what's being asked of Chow and Chan in the seduction scene. In the guise of understanding what happened, each victim attempts to seduce 
their own spouse in the form of the other's spouse. A task that has to be doomed from the start because the fact of the affair itself means that neither Chow nor Chan can any longer elicit that kind of desire that they're trying to recreate. You could describe this course of action as masochistic, and Wong Kar Wai lets us feel this by not making it obvious when Mr. Chow or Mrs. Chan are being themselves or being each other's spouses. Often we're a minute into the scene interpreting it one way before the reality, or perhaps the unreality of the moment, hits us like a gut punch. But because each player is constantly coaching the other, they're able to construct a fantasy in which they control their own betrayal. And by never consummating their own budding love for each other, Mr. Chow and Mrs. Chan can infinitely delay the moment in which they have to see things as they really are. They can stay in their fantasy. It's a tragic and twisted state of affairs, and Wong Kar Wai has said that if Tony Leung and Maggie Cheung weren't such beautiful actors, the darkness at the center of their characters and their fantasy would be obvious. Of course, they can't keep it up forever. And in the scene where Mr. Chow finally admits his love for Mrs. Chan, most of the fantasy comes crumbling down. As he says, they are like their spouses, which means that the thing they've been refusing to see, their own lack, that they've ceased to be an object of love for their loved one, rushes into consciousness like a wave. And yet still, they don't act on it. They can only let the brutal truth in so much. In order to survive, in order to move forward, Mr. Chow and Mrs. Chan doom themselves to missed connections. This is why at the end, the film jumps forward to see them just missing each other twice. Just missing each other. The mere possibility of a connection, not the connection itself, is what sustains them now. Everybody lives within fantasy, within frames. Sometimes the frames are made by us, sometimes they're made by others. Sometimes we need to believe that those made by us are made by others. But whatever the case, there's no way out of the frame. When fantasies rupture or crack or break down completely, that's trauma, like living temporarily in a storm. Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love is a gorgeous, quiet and painful exploration of what happens when the fantasy you create for yourself is a perverse one, when it only serves to keep you from confronting the pain that it was created to avoid. And the reason the film is so heartbreaking is because this kind of perversity is really quite common to all of us. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. God, I love this movie. Um, if you think that The Nerd Writer is something that you're not seeing anywhere else on YouTube and you want to help support it, help me keep putting the time and effort it takes to make videos like this, um, you can pledge to my Patreon page. That would be awesome. You guys have been amazing um, and every little thing helps. You can click here right now to do that. As little as one dollar. Thanks again and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already to get all these videos and stay tuned for some really cool stuff coming up, some cool collaborations coming up. And here are some more videos.